is so good to be in the Lord's house today. I want to uh, say to those online, happy Father's Day. We honor you this day. We have prayed for the fathers at church. And so we just want to wish you a blessed and happy Father's Day. We thank God for the godly men who are not only fathers, but are spiritual fathers to the many who are lacking in that arena. So God bless you all. And uh, we just love you and appreciate each and every one of you. Before we begin, I just want to open in a word of prayer to our Heavenly Father. Oh, Abba, we love you. We love you and we extol your name in this house. We praise you. We magnify you, O Lord God. We bless your name. We love you, Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for abiding in us, for bringing comfort in our lives, for leading us and guiding us and when we make errors, for correcting us toward righteousness. We love you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Oh, we love you. We praise you. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. You are a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Our bridegroom, the lover of our soul, and we love you. So, Father, I ask right now that you illuminate your word. Holy Spirit, may what is ushered out of me is orchestrated and ordained and anointed by you because this is for your glory O Lord and this we pray in the name which is above every name the name of Yeshua HaMashiach the name of Jesus Messiah we pray amen well I want to talk first this is not going to be a typical Father's Day message the Lord has taken me in a different direction I actually taught on this a couple years ago. I don't know if I preached it from the pulpit, but today you're going to get a little bit of a teaching. But first, I want to say this to the dads. The best decision, I'm going to speak from personal experience, but I know this to be truth, even in your life. The best and most important decision any man can make, any boy can make, any person can make, is when they admit they are a sinner in need of a Savior and believe on the Lord Jesus. We believe Yeshua, Jesus, is who the Bible says he is. We believe in the eternally self-existing God, in the persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that God, the Son, the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Messiah, left glory laid down his glory, was born of a virgin, wrapped in flesh. He lived a perfect life. Yes, he never sinned. And he willingly went to the cross and shed his precious blood to pay our sin debt, the penalty for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made him, who's him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. When we believe on the Lord Jesus, I'm going to get to that. His, he is Messiah and rose from the dead. We are the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus goes to the cross. And it's all sufficient. His redemptive work. Precious blood shed, paid the debt for us. And he cried out on the cross to tell us die. It is finished. The debt is paid in full. The job is perfectly done. He died, was buried. He conquered, held death in the grave. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tells us, as the scripture states, Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. That is the gospel of grace. And the nanosecond, the raptosecond, the instant, 
You've admitted you're a sinner in need of a Savior and believe on the Son of God. You are born again, indwelt with Holy Spirit, saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption, heaven bound, and rapture ready. Salvation is an event, not a process. That instant you believe. John 3.16 really gives us a beautiful depiction of it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, I'm a whosoever, are you a whosoever, believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us, if we confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth and believe in our heart. Now the heart, in Jewish thought, the heart is the left. Some, like in the United States, I hear a lot from the Jewish community, the leb, they'll do it with a B. But the leb is the inner man. And the Bible says, so if we confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For with the heart, the inner man, man believeth and is justified, just as if I had never sinned, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. See, from the abundance of the heart, the Bible tells us the mouth speaketh. That instant you believe he is the Son of God, the Messiah, always existed in everything we've outlined. He shed his blood, died for you, and he's Messiah, Mashiach, and rose from the dead. Boom! Done deal. Heaven bound and rapture ready. Praise God. Now, after we're saved, right, we know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and I'm going to add 10. For by grace, judgment would be getting what we deserve. Mercy would not be getting what we deserve. And grace is getting what we didn't deserve. The grace of God. His unmerited favor. Praise God. So Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves it is the gift of god why we call it the free gift of salvation not by works you can't earn your salvation you believe on the lord jesus he did it all hallelujah and rose from the dead not by works lest any man should boast now that you're saved ephesians 2 10 applies for we are created in his workmanship unto good works, which he prepared beforehand or pre-planned or preordained beforehand. Praise God. So we're not saved by works. We're not kept saved by works, but we are saved for works. So that's the gospel is the plumb line. Well, when I was five years old and I've shared my testimony before, so I'm going to abbreviate it. I got on a church bus. And southern New Jersey, I live, you know, the loveliest bride in all of heaven, Karen, she lived in the middle to northern part of New Jersey. I, that's where she grew up, middle New Jersey. I grew up in southern New Jersey. I'll never forget as a small child, the first time my father took me to North Jersey, I thought they were speaking a different language. I'm like, Dad, where are they from? He's like, New Jersey. He looked at me, I'm like, well, they talk different. The accent was different, and the people we were with, it was very heavy. In any event, um, I grew up in a very rural part, exit one off of the turnpike, for those who know where I'm talking about, Salem County. You go over the Delaware Memorial Bridge and you're in Delaware. And so that's where I grew up. And it was, my grandfather was a fisherman. Fishing industry, he had fish markets. Um, Cornfields, just like where I live now in central Illinois. Farming, some factories, those kinds of things. And I got on a church bus that came around, and I, I got on at five years old. And I heard Pastor Jim Travis preach. I was talking about this with some precious folks this week. A general, I consider her a general actually. In, in the work of the Lord. And I've shared about her before. I'm not going to go there today. I want to focus on this. 
but we are going to uh, be bringing resources. Now, I want to say this for those who are online. When I share schools and like the toys that we did, and I'm going to be sharing very soon again from our brother Clayton, I am not taking any funds for that. Also, there are people who are taking my image and creating a fake account and they're commenting and asking you for money. That is not me. I'm not commenting and asking you for money. I'm not doing that. So please, please be aware of that. I, I know this isn't part of the message, but I need you to know that. But in any event, I was sharing a little bit of the testimony and I'll share with those who may not know. I don't know why I didn't go to the children's church, but I didn't. I, and I did not know church etiquette. Although I, got, I have to tell you, nobody sat on the front pew anyway. I went right down the middle and sat on the front pew. And I'm sure they were looking at me at five years old thinking, but nobody said anything. And I was mesmerized as I heard Pastor Travis give the most eloquent sermon to this day. And maybe because it was so precious to me, because I'm going to tell you what happened. So, and this goes to what I want to say to the dads. The greatest decision a person can make is to believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe he is Messiah and he rose from the dead. To accept him into your life. That, that is the most important decision you can ever make. And so I sat on that front pew and I heard that message. And as a child who knew I was a sinner because I was told that all the time. I'm not going to go on all that. Hearing, it's, it still chokes me up to this day. And this is the message we want to bring to people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Abba. Hearing that I knew there was a God. I knew there was a God. But I didn't know much about God at five years old. I just knew there was a God. And that he loved me so much. That the Son of God, God the Son, part of the Godhead. I, just, I believed what Pastor Travis was preaching. Would die to pay the debts for my sin. I got it. And he rose from the dead and I believed. But I pondered on that truth all week long. When I would get in trouble in the house, I had this little red ball in my bedroom. I don't even know if my parents knew I did that. But it was something I could control. I'd sit there and I'd bounce that ball against the wall and back. And That Friday, I pondered it all week. It didn't leave me. Yes, children can believe and be saved. Born again. And I praise God because I give him all the glory. There is no glory to me. You've heard me say... I got saved at five and I've committed two sins since, too many to count. Not that I relish in that, because I, I want to continue being renewed in my mind daily, knowing my position in Christ Jesus in the heavenlies, and be washed in the purity of the truth of God's word. Always wanting to learn more and grow, and God is so good. But I, I said to the Lord with my little five-year-old theology, I thank God. I believed that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. And I said to the Lord, I want to be this rubber ball in your hands. Take my life and do with it what you will. And the reason it gets emotional for me is because God has spared me from so many things that I've seen other people have to go through. And there's no glory to me. I can do nothing apart from Holy Spirit. And so I give God all the glory. But he did spare me and save me. And this life, if I breathe my last today or get raptured, there's no regrets. Some people say, how can you say that? Because God is good. And I am so thankful that the lover of my soul is Jesus. And fathers, dads, the best decision you can ever make for your children, for your families, 
for yourself is to admit you are a sinner in need of a Savior and believe on the Lord Jesus. Well, the second, and, and my children know this, they're all grown now. All seven of them are adults, 14 grandkids, two on the way. Elijah will probably be here within two weeks. Praise God. And now Karen got her promotion. Hallelujah. The second best decision of my life was listening to Holy Spirit. I have to tell you, I'll never forget that day. Some of you know my story. I adopted children before I was married. It wasn't planned. It's a long story. And it was all God ordained. I was a virgin when I got married. So don't, don't think that I was out there. That's not the point. And I'm not ashamed of that. Again, I got saved at five. The best decision. was believing on the Lord Jesus. The second best decision was marrying the loveliest bride now in all of heaven. I used to refer to her as the loveliest bride in all the land. And before we got married, I told Karen, I said, you will never be my first love, although there is a place in my soul where only God and you abide. Special place reserved for her. But you will be my second love. And so we would always say that to one another. When a man will honor and love and cherish and care for his wife, did I do it perfectly? No way. Who who? Who of us are perfect in performance? We're perfect in position, hallelujah, to a holy God because of the precious blood of the Lamb. But when you honor your wife and you show her love, and as the Bible, as Paul taught us in Ephesians, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her, it's the greatest gift beside the Lord Jesus that you can share with your children. I'm telling you, hands down, I believe it. I believe it. And I did my best to live it. And praise God, Holy Spirit empowers us men to do even that. Um, excuse me. No, I'm not. I, of course, I get emotional sometimes about my family and my church family and online family, but I've been spending time in prayer over the lost. Because the heart of God is that all would be saved. And if we'll lean in and press into God, the Lord told me this week, I didn't even plan to share this, the Lord told me this week, that he's already provided now in these final moments of the end of days. He was so clear with me. And I wish I had it in front of me, but I'm going to do my best to recount it, to recall it. Holy Spirit, help me to do that. We are in the final moments of the end of days. And there is a shedding. He's already provided lust of the flesh. And I'm not talking about sex only. I'm talking about lust of the flesh. Those things that would have us worship at their altars rather than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Spend time in things that enter our eye gates and our ear gates that we shouldn't let happen because we need to be in the Word. It doesn't change the fact that you're born again. That's a done deal. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for the precious blood of Jesus and that he rose from the dead? I know I am. But recognize now that it's already been provided. And some of you, you're, you're allowing your souls to overwhelm your spirit, and that's being played out in your physical reality. 
We are three parts. We have a body. And by the way, God loves all three parts. Don't confuse your body with the carnal nature. Your body, flesh, bone, and blood, God loves your body. Your soul, where your mind, will, and emotions are, and then your spirit, where the spirit of God, if you're born again, abides and has indwelt you, and you are alive in Christ. Really, our spirits should overwhelm our souls, and that's what's played out as we fulfill the anointing, the ministries, and the calling God has on our lives. He's already provided. These things are going to drop off us. It's like a shedding of it right now. But you need to believe it, receive it, and walk in it. And stop doing some of the things that you're doing. Many of you have heard me use this example before. Through the years working with youth and, you know, a couple will come in and they'll say, Oh, Pastor Tim, we, we struggle with fornication. I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about this. Are there certain times during the week, during the day? Oh, yeah. When we're, you know, at her apartment at night. Well, don't go to her apartment at night. Go get in the word. You can't be in the presence of the Lord in praise and in the word. You can, that's what you want to do. And be that, doing that fornicating at the same time. So stop it. Or people would say, well, you know, we fornicated. I'm using those words so that if there's younger people watching, we don't get into. And it was an accident. I'm like, what? You were both jogging. Your mailboxes are next door. You were jogging to the mailbox naked and you collided. Come on. It's time to get real. But what I'm telling you is, it's already been provided for you. And some of you don't know it because it's become the norm in your life and you're clinging to those things. Let them go. Be renewed in your mind. Know your identity in Christ Jesus. Believe it, receive it, and walk in it. You're already saved. Now let's run this race. We're in the final lap. So I talked about marrying Karen was the second best thing I could do because of our God and because of my union with that beautiful, beautiful woman. I have, yes, I adopted a couple and then later we adopted one and we have four biological and it doesn't make a difference. Because of that, I have beautiful children and grandchildren who are so precious to me. Well, a few years ago, because I would recount to Karen, I would recount how, you know, I told Jesus, I just want to be a rubber ball for you. And on my birthday, she worked with a young man in our church and a dear sister and they had this beautiful box made and a red rubber ball like I had, which is very precious to me. It may not mean anything to many of you, but wow, what God, the gift that I have. And I am so thankful for 29 years <clears throat> with that precious, precious, mighty woman of God who now got her promotion. And she's working on the other side. I will see my Jesus. And I will see her very soon. And so I wanted to tell the dads today. And take a few moments. And encourage you. Not only believing on Jesus. And being born again. But also. Not everyone who's saved is a disciple. If you haven't heard the message from last week, go listen to that message as well. I don't know about you, but I want, my act of worship is not just when we sing praise and worship, like in church. Worship is how we live our lives, and he is worthy of our worship, isn't he? 
And so I know I'm not saved by anything I do. I'm not kept saved by that. It's all the blood of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Glory to God. It never gets old, does it, the gospel? So I know I've spent a little time on that. And men, love your wives and love your children and love others. We're going to take a little detour now into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And this is only because I was reminded of this in a 3BI class this week. It was referenced. And I know a couple years ago I did a teaching on this. I just couldn't find it. And the Lord said, no, bring this out again. There are some who need it. So this is not only for dads, this is for everyone. Let no man deceive you by any means. For the day shall not come, except there come a falling away. That word is a, is a they translated it falling away. I believe a better translation, I'm going to get to this, is departure. Excuse me. A falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now we know that the Bible's talking about the Antichrist. I firmly, and I'm going to share with you why, and I have for a few years now, believe the Apostle Paul is referring here to the rapture of the church. Now, if you follow at all, you know about the rapture. I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I've done many videos on that. We'll get into a little bit of the history of the Thessalonians very shortly. I'm going to share three of the primary reasons I am convinced that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the word apostasy, that Greek word, or apostasia, is speaking of the rapture and not a spiritual falling away. Although we know that that word can have that application as well. <clears throat> One, the context communicates an actual departure, a physical departure. The translation of the Greek word apostasia means that in this case, an actual physical departure. Now we know one of the primary verses or texts about the rapture of the church is in the first letter to the Thessalonians. By the way, these letters were the first letters that the apostle Paul wrote his first epistles chronologically. And so in the first letter, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, it really, if you start around verse 13, you can go look it up for yourself. He, he tells them, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, right? About those who sleep, meaning those who have gone on, like my wife. In 16, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Some people say, well, do they get a new body? Is that No. What happens is, just like with us, every, the smallest, whatever particle of their body is, because Jesus Christ conquered hell death in the grave the grave will not be able to hold that and their bodies will be changed from mortal to immortal from perishable to imperishable they're going to get a glorified body and so are we hallelujah no more carnal nature at that point praise god and so the context communicates that actual physical departure when you look at the translation of that word apostasia, when you look at this verse, remember we've taught on 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, one of the applications of rightly dividing is keeping 
the, the word or the verse in its context of not only the passage, but also the entirety of the word of God. And so in the context of the passage, when you look at the verses before and you look at the verses after, Paul is clearly, absolutely, unmistakably talking about the rapture and not the falling away from the faith. This is his first epistles, and it's about the rapture. Paul, in, in this second letter, Paul is reviewing ground he already covered. So for instance, when I teach, and sometimes I'll do a series, I've done a whole teaching uh, that's online on Tim Henderson TV, uh, most of them are up now on Revelation. So many times I'll go back and review uh, the lesson before. But when I give the review, I don't review everything. I don't repeat the entire lesson or give all the fundamental truths that built in supporting that lesson. So there are those who will say, um, the heart pot, so the word isn't in there. Why didn't Paul use it like he did in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? The, the caught up will be caught up. It's actually the Greek word harpazo, which later got translated into one of the Latin versions into raptoro, or some people use a different form of that word, and we took on the word to describe it as rapture. But it's the harpazo. It is the fierce catching away. It's, it's likened unto, the best explanation I can use is, a small child is in the road, and a big rig is just about to hit them, and the parent fiercely, forcefully grabs them, snatches them, catches them out of the way. That's the application of harpazo. And while that's not there, that's irrelevant. So some people try to use that. That's not the case. Paul is clearly talking about the Lord's return. He was not talking about falling away from the faith to the Thessalonians in his first letter. Nowhere. What he was talking about, these end times and the rapture. Actually, it wasn't until Paul's latter days when, and you look in the letter to Timothy, when he speaks to the end time apostasy, meaning that wholesale rejection of Christ, that turning from the faith. And so early on, and this was early on, this was Paul's first letters to the Thessalonians. He was talking about the rapture. In the first, we, you know, in the first letter, 1 Thessalonians, and now in the second. In rightly dividing, context is key in interpreting words and phrases and what we put into sentences, because it wasn't that way in the original, especially with words that have multiple meanings. And I'm going to give you an example. Because apostasia can mean departure, a physical departure, like the rapture, or it can mean that falling away from the faith. Take the word apple, for example. A apple can refer to a fruit, a computer, or, or phones, or pads, iPads, uh, the focus of one's eye, you're the apple of my eye. Or even a city, New York City, the big apple. So when you see the word apple in a paragraph, for instance, how do you know what the meaning is? By the context. If apple is found in context dealing with fruit salad, it would be invalid to apply it to a computer. In Thessalonians chapter 2, the word apostasia is in the context of the church. Now, I, Dr. Brim says this, and I, I agree 100%. I believe it. I have always, always, since I've been in my early 20s, liked the word assembly better, using the ecclesia, the called out ones. That would be the, we refer to as the church, the body of Christ. Everyone, 
from the Jews or the nations, whether you're Jew or Gentile, you have believed on the Lord Jesus. He's Messiah and he rose from the dead. You, you've had that change of mind, that metanoia, and you believe on him. Then you're born again. You're born again. Then you are part of the ecclesia, the assembly, the body of Christ, which is also the bride of Christ. So it's so important to understand that when you look at that word apostasia in the context, it is so clear. Now, I want to say this. If you disagree with me, you, I still love you. You're my brother and sister in Christ. If you have believed on Lord Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, I, we don't need to battle about this. You don't need to agree with me on this. You're still going to heaven. I'm still going to heaven. And you know what? When we get there, we can find out for sure. I believe it, and I'm only sharing with you. So this is not an issue that should ever divide anyone in the body of Christ. I want to say this too. None of us knows it all. I heard a dear brother, uh, Larry Allison, do teaching on heaven this week, and he said there are brothers and sisters in the Lord that he has had close fellowship with through the years, and they may have disagreed on something, especially when you're talking about eschatology and time studies. And there have been times that he's looked into what they've shared, and he found out he was wrong. There have been times that they found out they've been wrong. None of us knows it all. What's important is understanding the gospel, and we're going to get to that again in a little bit. Secondly, early Bible, this is so, to me, this is one of the most profound and determining factors that helped me understand that this is actually talking about, <coughs> excuse me, the rapture of the church and not the falling away, like the great falling away, like Paul was talking to Timothy about latter in his ministry. Early Bible translations favor the physical departure view. And, and I'm going to share this. So the earliest Bible translations render the noun apostasia, we say apostasy, as departure. I have proof of this. Wycliffe in 1384. All of these that I'm going to name viewed it as the physical departure, which means the rapture of the church. Tyndale in 1526. Coverdale in 1535. Cranmer in 1539, Breaches in 1576, Beza in 1583, and the Geneva Bible both in 1599 and 1608. So you might say, well, Pastor Tim, then why is it now, in many of the translations, falling away? Well, we're going to talk about that for a moment. That translation change, the noun apostasia, went from, in some translation, departure or departing to falling away in some of the latter translations. Dr. Thomas Ice said this about it, though, quote, most scholars say that no one knows the reason for the translation shift. However, implausible theory, a plausible theory has been put forth by Martin uh, Butella, in his Master of Theology thesis produced at Dallas Theological Seminary in 1998. And this is, that's end quote. This is what he says. Now, I didn't, I didn't take the whole book, but I'm going to quote because I want you to know what they said. I'm reading what they actually share. It appears that the Catholic, this is the Roman Catholic Church, the Catholic translation into English from Jerome's Latin Vulgate, known as the Rhymes Bible, 1576, was the first to break the translation trend. Apostasia was revised from the departure to the Protestant revolt. Now, what does that mean? 
Revolution is the terminology still in use today when Catholicism teaches the history of the Protestant Reformation. They still say it was a revolt or a revolution. <clears throat> there is also under this pope. Yeah, I know, if I get started there, if I go down that rabbit trail, we won't get out of it. So I'm going to skip that. Um, I'm not going to say any more right now. Holy Spirit is arresting me. We're going to thank you, Lord. Under this guise, a guise of what they're saying, apostasia would refer to a departure. This is what the Catholics were doing. To you know, there were years. It was somewhere in the 19, maybe 1960. I even heard this week. They wouldn't let the common man read the Bible um, because there were things in there that would go against their doctrines. Under this guise, apostasia would refer to a departure from not the rapture, but as they explained it or taught their priest and hierarchy, a departure of Protestants from the Catholic Church, which to them would mean a falling away, because if you're not Catholic, according to their theology and doctrine, well, I don't even think you get to go to their make-believe purgatory or if you go straight to hell, according to them. But again, I am not slamming. Listen, I know there are Catholics who are saved. There are people from all denominations saved. So we have uh, Catholic brothers and sisters who follow, who believe they are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Praise God for them. And we love each and every one of them. But that was through their distorted lens. We have to be careful that, you know, it happens often in our lives with our value system. We, we look at things through our lens. We need to keep it in accordance with the word of God. And here's why. Because the change in translation appears to be theologically rather than exegetically motivated. So they're taking their thoughts on what it's saying versus what the word is actually saying and keeping it in context. And then last, three main reasons. 2 Thessalonians 2.3. In it, Paul, it is part of Paul reviewing or what I would call a review, a review course. If you ever, I think in the 70s and 80s, often with sitcoms, because they were limited to actually 27 minutes, I think it was, when you add in ad time and that kind of thing. But there would be 30 minute segments, right? When it would be to be continued, when they would start the following week or whatever it is, you'd see snapshots, just real brief, of what was going. Well, 2 Thessalonians 2.3 is part of a review. Paul is writing a second letter about, I'm going to say a year after his first letter, to review and clarify, and because there was a forged letter sent after he left, and it was confusing and scaring the Thessalonians. They thought they had missed the rapture, and they were already in the tribulation. They were being persecuted also. Some were living in idleness in view of the Lord's return. Many, right, this was written, what, somewhere around 50, 51 AD. Many who had been around when Jesus was alive had died off, and now some of them were dying off, and they're thinking, man, we've missed the rapture, and we're already in the tribulation. And they needed to be corrected with regards to the day of the Lord. Many people, for instance, confuse the rapture, nothing else needs to happen for the rapture of the church, with the second coming of Christ. So when does the rapture happen? At the very end of this dispensation, this church age, or some like to call it uh, the dispensation of grace. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. So this dispensation is 
coming to a close. We are in the final moments of the end of days. And when it does, this dispensation will roll up. You've heard me often talk about it. We want people to get, they can get saved during the tribulation, but they won't be the bride of Christ. And that's, I don't have time to go into that again today, but I've done a lot of teaching on that. <coughs> and then another dispensation begins, and that would be the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year dispensation. People get in trouble where, where they even take scriptures and don't understand that Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25, and Revelation chapter 6 through 18 is dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble, with the tribulation period. The church, the believers, we're out of here. We're gone. Praise God. And so these believers were fearful that they were already in it. Their fears were strengthened by false rumors to the effect that Paul himself was teaching that the day was now present. So the apostle sets the record straight. You know, it's real interesting when you look at even what Jesus said and you look at what Paul was saying, let no man deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Rightly divide the word of truth. While all of the Bible is for the believer, not all of the Bible is about the believer. I have been saying that for years, and then I hear Dr. Billy Brim teaching this. Just praise God, I believe that in the body of Christ there are things that God wants us to understand and get in these final moments. We're supposed to go from glory to glory to glory, and then our ultimate glorification, praise God. Just like there are three people groups, 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Give no offense, neither to the Jews, nor the nations, the goyim, we refer to as the Gentiles. Some of the New Testament, you would hear the Greeks because it was Hellenized, but same thing, the nations, nor the ecclesia, the called out ones, the assembly, us, the body of Christ. You need to know in rightly dividing not only context, but who's speaking and to whom. You want to know about us? Read the Pauline or the prison epistles. I'm going to give you another example. So many times when I'll meet people and, you know, the evangelist in me and all the glory to God, that's one of the giftings he's given me. I'll ask people, are you a Christian? Yeah. Are you a believer? Yeah. And I'll say, if you were to die today and stand before a holy God, and he'd, he'd ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And I get a lot of, well, I tried to live good. I hope I'm going to make it. I went to church. I got baptized. I gave to the poor. Well, that's all great things to do. But if that's what you put your trust in, eh, wrong answer. You don't want the result of that. Because you believe on the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the Christ, the Anointed One. He shed his blood, died, was buried, conquered, held death in the grave, and rose from the dead. You believed on him. Solo fide. Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. People even confuse the gospel of the kingdom, which Jesus was preaching. Who was he preaching to? Who was he teaching to? Who did he come to? The Jews, the house of Israel. He was talking about his kingdom that is going to come. <coughs> post the rapture, post the tribulation period. That battle of Armageddon, and then his feet land on the Mount of Olives. It splits in two. And he takes his rightful place on the Davidic throne. Praise God. The millennial kingdom. And in a future teaching, I'm going to go into greater detail on those things. But that is different than the gospel of our salvation or the gospel of grace 
1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, what was the musterion that Jesus Christ died for, right? You believe he's Messiah and he rose from the dead. Boom! You believed on the Lord Jesus. What did Paul and Silas say to the jailer in Acts 16? He said, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus. What did the one thief on the cross do? He believed he was Mashiach. He believed. Romans 10, 13. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are in this dispensation, praise God. And it is coming to a close. This is how we're going to close before I give you the blessing. I hope that answers the question for everyone, why I believe. I, it was so placed on my heart to share that. And I really believe that part of that is because we are in the final moments of the end of days. We occupy and redeem the time till he comes. We're not going to lie around idly. No room for depression. That doesn't belong in our lives. We're already seated in Christ in the heavenlies. He's our head. We are the body. Therefore, all power, dominion, rule, and authority is under his feet, under our feet. When God, the Father, Abba, sees you, he sees you seated in Christ. In fact, he sees you already glorified. Hallelujah. Boy, if we could see ourselves the way that he sees us, praise God. I need to say this, and you, I hope you get this. Nothing, nothing, nothing else needs to happen for the harpazo, the rapture of the church. Jesus Christ is coming soon for his bride. It's not the second coming. It's the rapture of the church. In the meantime, we should be the people with the most joy on the planet. And if we, I've been sharing this, you know, it was a couple years ago now that the Lord said to me so clearly in these final moments, remain humble, be obedient, carry no offense, be quick to forgive. And everything we do, do in the love of God. And then just a few months ago, a couple months ago, two, three, four, I'm not sure. No, it was between Karen's promotion and now. So within the last, let's say, three months, because she's been gone four months. Within the last three months, the Lord, and oh, he's demonstrated to me. In these final moments, he needs us for us to be effective and to stay in our derrick, our path. The ministry, the destiny, the anointing he has for us we need to cooperate with Holy Spirit. Be led by Holy Spirit. Listen, you're already saved. Some people come in, oh, you're saying I have to. No, you're already saved. Don't you want to? Don't you want to be led by Holy Spirit? Because in these very, I mean, final moments, he's going to use those. He can, because you're going to lean into him. Press into God. Be renewed in your mind. Know your identity in Christ. I pray Ephesians 1, uh, 17, and then it, I go down through that chapter. I make it personal. And then through chapter, chapter 2 through verse 7, but I, I don't hit all those verses, but it's okay. I've shared that before. Pretty much every day. I want to be renewed in my mind and washed in the purity of the truth of God's word. And as we lean in, as we abide in his presence, as we are led by, cooperate with Holy Spirit, we are going to see things like we have never seen before. You know, there is an awakening going on around the world. It's reported that every month 80,000 Chinese are, are, are being saved. Born again every month in the underground church. Iran. Iran is the area where the church is growing the fastest. In the West, we often see everything from our perspective. It becomes all about us. It's not all about us. Not that way. 
We're not even one of the nations of prophecy. Maybe, maybe um, the one prophecy about the lion and her cubs, we might be in there. But when Jesus said, watch the fig tree, Israel, which the world is, all attention is on Israel, and watch the other trees, he's talking about the nations of prophecy. So while he loves us, and we pray, we take authority in our communities, our cities, our rural areas, our states, and our nation. Praise God. Prayers. Thank God for the prayers and the intercessors. We are at the end of this dispensation. And so we should be the people. Nehemiah 8.10. You know, Nehemiah, I mean, pretty much, they had swords in one hand and building a wall on the other. And Nehemiah said, under that kind of diversity, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So brothers and sisters, go forward knowing that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if we will lean into him, know our identity in him, and cooperate with Holy Spirit, we are going to see things that we have never seen before. All the glory to God. It is a time of rejoicing. It is a time for us to fulfill the destiny that God has called us to and know that in these final moments, we want to boldly reach people with the gospel of grace because in the next 60 seconds, 105 people will breathe their last and they will go into eternity. Well, I'm going to close with a blessing on you today. Again, this is more of a teaching than because you know, but this is what the Lord led me to today, praise God. So I pray you are blessed by it. And I pray this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his countenance be lifted on you and his shalom, his peace, perfect, whole, complete, nothing lacking, nothing missing be yours in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus Messiah, I pray and I bless you. Shalom and have an awesome rest of your day.